please welcome Keith Stones. One technical change. <laughs> Well, she sets it up. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank the Newport Historical Society, Ruth and staff, and her, and what an asset we have in this community. And it's been a privilege to be on the board and to work with them um, most of my adult life. Um, I also want to thank the Rhode Island Committee for the Humanities. They provided this grant to my wife and I to do this in two years of research. And it's given us an opportunity to travel to Jamaica, to Philadelphia, to Connecticut, to New York, uh, and back here to Rhode Island. And, this is something that we're quite excited about. In fact, our friends in the UK, uh, through the Barclays Bank, is working with us, and they had a film crew with us in Jamaica, and they're actually developing a larger documentary on the story, because as you will see, it is one of the most famous and most well-documented, both emancipation and more importantly, reparations efforts in the history of enslaved Africans in the Atlantic world. So we're quite excited that we're able to bring this story, which has as much a Newport connection not only some of my family, but as you'll see, to a number of critical institutions of 18th, 19th, early 20th century Newport. So, the title we chose, Legacies of Slavery and Freedom, A Family Journey Through the Fix uh, Texas Atlantic World, it really is something that we think has less to do with history, but more to do with what is today, which is representing the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, what they're simply trying to say is, Black Lives Matter, and in history, we're trying to present that Black Lives Matter today and then. And you'll have an opportunity which, again, might be a rare viewpoint in seeing the issues of slavery, and the institutions of African enslavement. We're going to talk less about the institutions and the slave owners and the slave masters and the system and talk more about the people. In fact, one of my passions in this, growing up in Newport and having access to this history, is the fact that in each and every case, these are people we're talking about, African men, women, and children, and families. They didn't arrive in the new world as a blank slate. They brought with them their customs, their foodstuffs, their religion, their music, and it all became a part of us today in Brazil, or Jamaica, or Barbados, or Charleston, or Newport, Rhode Island. So the story that you're going to see today is not a story of slavery. It's a story of forced immigrants who were able to evolve and adapt in some of the most difficult circumstances and contribute greatly to the new world in our own community of Newport. Now, I'm going to have two quotes, one to start and one to end, that are very important to me. This quote, which comes from an unknown Ghanaian source, is important because many of the Africans that have arrived in New England, and particularly here in Newport, originated from the Gold Coast of what is today Ghana. In fact, we think close to 70 to 75% of the Africans that have arrived here in the 17th and 18th century largely came from what is today Ghana. And I think this quote, which means much to me, and should mean much to you in the understanding of the African people, it's the human being that counts. I call gold, it does not answer. I call cloth, it does not answer. It's a human being that counts. It means what's important in interpreting this history is not the institution, it's the people who lived it, who survived it, and their ancestors to this day. Probably the most transformative experience to shape the settlement, the religious, the cultural, the economic formation of what we call the Atlantic world. Western Europe, Africa, largely Western Africa, to the West Indies, to North and South America, was the enslavement and the transportation of Africans. In fact, what separates African enslavement as compared to any time in world history of enslavement of human beings, it's the first time, in the most deliberate time, that slavery is based singly on race. If you are born to an African enslaved woman, you are born a slave. At no other time in world history did you have this heredity-based slave system, which kept intact for over three and a half centuries a single race of people across an entire Western Hemisphere. So it's important to recognize the fact that the insidious nature of the African enslavement and why it lasted so long and why it impacted at least 10 million people that crossed the Atlantic was with the very fact that it was statutorily required that by race, you were a slave for life and through generations. And it's also important to recognize that from a scale standpoint, we now know Professor Eric Foner was one of my heroes. He's chair of the Columbia University Department of History. He's probably the most foremost historian on Reconstruction era history in America. 
Back in about 1997-98, as a part of President Clinton's forum on race and reconciliation, he was asked to provide kind of a, give us the big picture statement to set this conference. And he stated simply, of the 12 and a half million people that would cross old world to new world between about 1500 to 1820, that's the pilgrims, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, out of all the people who land in South Central America, North America, out of that 12 and a half million, almost 10 million of those were enslaved Africans. So when you think in terms of the very settlement, the very evolution of populations in the West Indies, it's largely, if you take North America out of the equation, it's largely African based. So it's important to understand that the influence of African culture, African religion, African commerce and trade and work, the more we understand that, the more we can understand the histories of the Americas. And it also transformed Newport. Newport in the 17th and 18th century would evolve into a major seaport. Some scholars will say that we were the fourth, possibly the fifth largest seaport in British North America at that time. Newport, initial trade in the West Indies was tied to Barbados in the 17th century. <clears throat> Later would evolve into Jamaica. A large part of the trade of Newport was the trading of raw materials from the West Indies to be brought to Newport, particularly sugar and molasses that would be distilled into rum. And in fact, by the mid 18th century, Newport was the largest producer of what we call the Guinea rum. There were anywhere from 20 to 22 rum distilleries operating on Newport waterfront. We talk about the drinking and hooting and hollering now. Could you imagine what it would have been in 1775 or 1776 in downtown Newport? And Newport was very much tied, the Newport merchants were very much tied to what was later called the triangular trade. Trade between West Africa, taking the slave Africans in West Africa, transforming pointing them to the New World, largely Brazil, out of that 10 million, 6 million went to Brazil. About 600,000 would go to Jamaica alone, and about a half million, give or take, not exact averages, would end up in British North America. But Newport is at the very center of this trade, and we prospered quite well in that trade. And before talking about Jamaica, John Brown himself, a province, once stated in a letter to his brother Moses, I don't think there's any estate in Newport that was not built from the trade of guineas in Africa. So it's important to understand that Newport's wealth, its maritime wealth and what we call our golden age of the 18th century, is very much tied to this triangular trade which is centered on enslaved Africans being transported to West Africa and then being the workforce in the West Indies that would produce the raw materials that would come back to Newport to be distilled into rum. In Jamaica, as I said, there's a major transformation going on. Jamaica, as it becomes a British colony, with the discovery of now sugar and the importance of sugar, becomes one of the largest and most important sugar producers. It rivals St. Dominique or later Haiti. And we now know that at least 600 Africans are transported by the late 17th century and really accelerating into the mid 18th century from Africa to Jamaica. And like Newport, New England, as I said before, we now know that many of the Africans that would come to Jamaica came from what is today Ghana. Now, it's, it's interesting why that would be the case, but if you think in terms of logic, we are a British North America, we are a British colony. We're not trading with the French or the Dutch or the Spanish or the Portuguese, we're at war with them. Not economic war, we're at physical war. So we're trading within British colonies. So you think in terms of what were the British colonies in the West Indies? Well, it's Antigua, it's Barbados, it's Bahamas, it's Jamaica. What are the British strongholds in West Africa, the slave fortresses? Well, there's Elmina, there's Cape Coast, and there's Ananabo. In fact, we have found dozens and dozens of documents from the University of Liverpool of Newport merchants trading actively in Ananabo, which is a coastal town in today in Ghana. So when you think from a logical standpoint, Newport merchants are trading with fellow English merchants in other English colonies. So Newport and Jamaica are very much tied together. They're tied at the hip. And there's significant amounts of documents here at the Newport Historical Society that points to this trade relationship. But we begin to see a very interesting story evolve in Jamaica. And our story begins at a place called Unity Valley Penn. Uh, Penn is the English term for farm, or grazing farm. 
When we think in terms of West Indian plantations, we immediately think of the coffee plantation, the tobacco, the lesser degree, the sugar plantations, which were large, which were brutal. Well, what we don't know and what we don't see is the fact that in the center of Jamaica, away from the coast, away from the sugar plantations, there were a number of grazing pens. And these grazing pens were literally used for livestock husbandry for the purposes of providing livestock support and foodstuff support for the larger plantations. And Unity Valley Pen was one of the largest of the grazing pens in Jamaica in the mid-18th century. What we also know is that Unity Valley Pen, located in central Jamaica, had direct access to all the major markets from Kingston to Spanish Town um, to Ocho Rios and other major markets. So this Unity Valley Pen, which in fact the Jamaica National Trust has given our family a copy of the actual, this is the Meets and Bounds survey by Sir David Mark, who acquired the pen in 1790. Uh, it measured about 50 to 60 acres, just under 60 acres, so not large in terms of some of the larger sugar plantations. But we actually have an inventory of the number of horses, hogs particularly, other livestock were kept, which were in the hundreds and hundreds. And there's always turnover because some are used for slaughter, and then the meat was then transferred and sold to the sugar plantations and the enslaved Africans on those plantations. In other cases, other products, what they call the Jamaican grass or guinea grass, uh, was used to provide to support the food stuff for other livestock. But being in the center, it's a very important part of the larger Jamaican economy. What we also know in 1790, the pen was claimed in a debt by a, Britain, a British merchant named Sir David Barclay and his brother David. Before I do this, I'm going to show you this. This is actually Unity Valley Valley Pen. Uh, this past summer, my wife and I were invited by the Jamaica National Trust to come to the pen. Uh, we actually were there to join the Barclays of Great Britain to bring the actual enslaved and enslaved together at the same location. So it was a big deal in Jamaica. They had cameras and people there and such. Um, I was just hot because I'm so disconnected from that over five, six generations. 90 degrees in the sun was a lot for me. But in any case, one of the things that the Jamaican Trust has been doing is, is they're doing a series of archaeological digs around the area, and they have actually found shards of blue plate grass that date back to, they believe, around the 1780s or 90s. Uh, in any case, they've given that to our family as a, as a gift or as a token of connection to Jamaica, which is very special to us. But this David Barclay, who is a prosperous merchant in London, He's today recognized with his brother and family as the founders of what is today Barclays Bank, the Quaker Bank. David Barclay is most recognized today in, in British history, really Quaker history, of being the grandson of Robert Barclay, the apologist. Uh, Robert Barclay in 1675 wrote a treaty, a 400-page treaty, on um, behalf of King Charles to basically defend that Quakers were not a threat to the British crown and were not a threat to the Protestant throne. And if you've ever read it, it's quite interesting. I mean, it's, 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 it's a lot of reading, but it's interesting because it's almost a primer on what Quakers are not. We're not bad, we're not evil, we don't do these things. This is why we do the things we do. And Robert Barclay today is recognized as probably the first true Quaker theologian and the first person to really bring Quakers out of the back alleys into the forefront. And the Barclay family is a gift to my family several years ago actually gave us an original copy, a 1765 copy of the Apology, signed by David Barclay himself to his nephew, Charles Barclay. But most important, David Barclay is a Quaker and a banker and a merchant. Before the American Revolution, he is very tied to Philadelphia, yet another important Quaker community. Not as important as Newport. People tend to forget that the earliest settlements, the earliest establishments of Quakers in the New World, in the Americas, is as much Newport as it is Pennsylvania, particularly our point neighborhood. But in any case, um, David Barclay is trading in the linen trades and other merchandise with Benjamin Franklin. He's very much tied to the Philadelphia Quaker community. He becomes a member, um, an honorary member of the Quaker Church in Philadelphia. Most importantly, he's also in the UK an associate of William Wilberforce, who today is recognized as the first true abolitionist, at least in the UK, in fighting against the cause of African enslavement. And he's also closely tied to Josias Webber, who actually designed the very famous Am I Not a Man symbol of the Ab Abolitionist, Abolitionist Society. 
Uh, the Barclay family tells me that they actually funded that, and they actually have the original rings that they've shown me, the actual stamps that they used to stamps and press and paper. So David Barclay is a significant individual. He's a leading Quaker. It's in his pedigree. He's a leading business merchant. Um, the Barclays Bank, as a Quaker bank, was still involved in the trade, not as much as the Bank of Scotland and others, but they were still underwriting the trade. David Barclay was appalled at that, but he was particularly appalled at the fact that he now acquired a plantation with enslaved Africans in Jamaica himself. And he would write letters back and forth to family members, to friends, he would talk to Wayne Wilberforce and say, what should I do? I have to completely divorce myself of this. He contacts his Philadelphia associates and suggests, what should I do? In fact, he immediately joins, and I'm going to read this, the Pennsylvania Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery and for the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage. He joins that. This is actually his certificate with the stamp. Um, more importantly, as he joins this organization, he begins to have dialogue with Philadelphia Quakers about, we need to do something different about emancipating these Africans. His first thought was to emancipate them in Jamaica and then be done with it, as most did. Most slave owners would emancipate slaves either by will or by deed or by trust, and then they were done with it. You're on your own. You're free. I've given you the greatest thing you should want and need is freedom. The Jamaica community at that time had little interest in having free Africans roaming through the countryside. In fact, one of the great dangers and challenges, um, I think restitution for enslavers in Jamaica, was the advent of the Maroon community. Africans would run away into the hinterland, a lot of times in the center of the island, would organize fighting groups, almost commando groups called Maroons, and then they would go and they would hit, and then they would in some cases burn down and even kill enslavers and families across the countryside. So the thought of freeing further Africans and leaving them on their own in Jamaica was not plausible for the slave society and was probably not fair or plausible for the individuals themselves. In fact, there are 32 African Jamaicans as a part of the Shinnity Valley Pen. Seven of them are under the age of 12, and there are 10 women. So the fact that they could just simply be freed was not plausible and not practical and not something David Barclay had an interest in. And I, I just want to, this comes directly from David Barclay's diary that his conviction was so much beyond just simply emancipation. He says, I'm firmly convinced that the retaining of my fellow creatures in bondage was not only irreconcilable with the precepts of Christianity, but subversive of the rights of human nature. There were so few men, women, institutions even thinking that way in the 18th century. It's not about freedom, it's about equality. We are equal under one God. So David Barclay is at a level of thinking in belief systems that was well beyond anyone around him outside of that small Quaker abolitionist group in Philadelphia. So the belief is, if we're going to transport them, if we're going to do something to them, the safest place, the best place, the most logical place would be Philadelphia. <coughs> and in accordance with Quaker, convictions, he decides to remove them from Unity Valley Penn, Jamaica, and transport them physically to Philadelphia. Now, we know this because he took it a step further. In 1797, then again in 1801, and 1810, 1820, the number of printings, he actually prints a primer on the entire account of emancipating his slaves. And if you read it very carefully, and I've read it with Barclay family members in the UK, he's actually telling other slave owners and slave institutions, here's what you need to do. Step one, you free them. That's step one. Step two, you set them up with a vocation so they can build a livelihood. Step three, you give them a dowry. You give them funds. You give them an annuity. Give them money to give them a chance to pursue an education, a trade, or a craft, and build a family. In step three, you put them in a safe environment with other fellow Africans and other white institutions who will support them. What he was talking about in the late 18th century is reparations. There are nearly no institutions or individuals or slave owners in the 18th century or 19th century that would support anything near reparations. And today, 
as I'm in Jamaica, the Jamaicans are being very clear to me, they see this as a story to push for an agenda on reparations in 2016. Because as you'll see in a few minutes, the opportunities that my ancestors had, starting way back in the 18th century, was something that few other African heritage people could even hope for, even to this day. I was embarrassed to be in Kingston, Jamaica, and to see people who looked a little bit like me, and my kids and my family, living in abject poverty. I'm walking through this Unity Valley pen saying, oh, I feel emotional, oh, I feel connected, oh my God, this is where my ancestors were enslaved, and then I get into downtown Kingston saying, you know what, I'm lucky. I should feel absolutely lucky. Because my family, my kids, I get to go back and Newport, Rhode Island, and we have hot, cold running water. We know where the next food on our table will come from. So what's important to understand here is that David Barclay created a pathway, a pathway for emancipation, reparations, and equality for all God's children. So who were these Africans, and specifically who was this one boy that we're going to trace the story on? Well, at the direction of Barclay, these Africans are gathered up, they're placed in new clothes, they're brought to the docks of Kingston, I actually went to the physical dock where they left, and we actually have the records in the Jamaican National Archives. On July 27, 1795, they arrived in the Jamaica, a small brig in Philadelphia. They were initially met by a new Quaker committee, which was formed, and this Quaker committee was formed called the Pennsylvania Society for the Improvement of the Conditions of Free Blacks. <clears throat> it's not abolition now, these are free blacks. Now we have to improve their condition. They are met, they are also greeted by two African American men. One is Richard Al. Richard Al is the Reverend, and he is the one who is the founder of the Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first of its kind. And a second man, Reverend Absalom Jones, who was the founder of the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas. Both these men, a few years earlier, had formed the Second African Free Union Society of America, the first here in Newport. And both these men, their jobs were to bring these Africans into their places of worship, provide comfort to them, and housing for them. The younger, one of the second youngest member of this group is a boy named October. This is the actual register from 1795, it's actually September, about two months after they landed in the Pennsylvania Historical Society in an inventory of each of the Africans and their names. And you can see here in highlighted yellow, we have October, who is eight. How many were there? Many there were 28. Uh, six died within several months because of weather and such. Another five later. In a few minutes, I'll tell you, only two of them, my family and one other family, we've been able to trace and document with primary and secondary document information. Um, that's a whole other research opportunity we'd love to take on. But what's most important is that this October, along with two other boys, David Barkley requests that they be given the Barkley name. So October is given the name Robert and becomes Robert Barkley, named after possibly David Barkley's great-grandfather. A second one is David, named after David Barkley, and a third, whose name was Kwashi, which is a very traditional Ghanaian day name, is given the name George Barkley, each of different George Barkley family members. Robert Barkley is my great-great-grandfather. So this eight-year-old boy in 1795 arrives in, really, the latter stages of the, Amer the end of the American Revolution and moving into antebellum Philadelphia. Now, I just want to present what we call Robert Barkley's world and how things converge. As I had said earlier, the first African Methodist Episcopal Church founded by Reverend Richard Allen in Philadelphia, I want to say 17, I should have the dates there, about um, 1794. And then his compatriot, Reverend Absalom Jones, forms the St. Thomas African Episcopal Church. They had a little bit of a difference. Allen felt that for Africans and African Americans, true freedom is best expressed through the Methodist faith. Absalom Jones said, I was raised an Episcopalian, I believe we should be Episcopal, I'm going to stay closer. So they created two separate churches, but still under an umbrella of an African Union Society. What's really neat is that these two men in their African Union Society learned how to establish a free African society by corresponding with free Africans in a place called Newport, Rhode Island. 
a Henry Stewart, who is a trustee of the Church of St. Thomas, is sent to Newport in 1789 to meet with the Africans, correspond with the Africans, and learn more about how the Newport African Union Society was established and organized. The Newport Society is the first free African society in the Americas. It's established in 1780 by Abraham Casey and nine other Africans in Newport. What's remarkable is, here at the Newport Historical Society, and what an asset, we have the minutes of the African Union Society from between about 1787 to about 1820. And in the minutes, they talk in detail about setting up burial funds, organizing around religious services, they talk about returning to Africa, they talk about setting up trade between, at the time, the most important urban African free communities of America, which was Newport, Providence, Boston. For some reason, New York was still a bit of a challenge. It was very difficult for Africans. New York was as much a southern economy and a southern culture in the 18th century. And then Philadelphia. What's really neat, and there's just one letter here. This is a letter that Absalom Jones, Caesar Thomas, Caesar Weatherton, they are the trustees of the African Society of Philadelphia. They are receiving a letter from Anthony Taylor and Caesar Linden of Newport. And both of them are buried here at our God's of Lakers section of Common Burial Ground. And in the letter, they're thanking of Henry Stewart coming to Newport and having discourse with Henry Stewart. And they're also sending a letter, a second letter, introducing Henry Stewart to another <coughs> African in Boston named Prince Hall, who would later be the founder of the Prince Hall Masons, the colored Masons, the black Masons. So what's important is, is that this young Robert Barclay, as he arrives in America, he's not just arriving as a free, yet another free African, or now African American. He's arriving, he's living in the midst of some of the most important and earliest of black institutions. Black men and women who are thinking freely, worshiping freely, and involved in free commerce. I can't tell you how important that is for 1800, 1805, because as we know, as you should know, most people of African heritage in America were enslaved at that time. <coughs> so this young Robert Barclay is arriving at a time, interacting at a time, of what we today recognize as the black founders, the founding institutions, the founding men and women, founding religious orders. And in Robert Barclay's world, he becomes indentured to a John Chapman, who's the trustee of the Arch Street Quaker Church. He's also involved in what we call chair making, Windsor chair making. And we actually have the records. Robert Barclay is trained as a Windsor chair maker. I wish to God we kept it. Later you'll see other chairs that we have. We don't have a Windsor chair. <laughs> but in any case, there was a bit of a recession and by the 1820s, no one is really as much involved in Windsor chair making. In fact, we find in the records, um, Robert Barclay, as he's getting up, he's growing older, he's also learned to become a cabinet maker or a woodworker, any of the carpentry, fine carpentry skills. He's a finished painter, as is John Chapman. We also find that Robert Barclay is living at that time in what is called the Seventh Ward of Philadelphia, down on the waterfront, Lombard Street. <clears throat> the Seventh Ward of Philadelphia is quite famous. Uh, at the time, it would have the largest free black community in all of America. There are about 12,000 blacks living free, free marginally for many. Not free and equal, but free. <clears throat> but at least, it was a large community of free blacks. There were upper class blacks, there were leading blacks, there were mostly poor blacks. But Robbie Barkley was working and living in this, in this system. And most importantly, as a young man, he had a trade, a very important trade skill. He was educated, his education was paid for. He was a member initially of the Mother Bethel AME Church, and then when he married, which I'll talk about in a second, he moved to the St. Thomas Episcopal Church. So this Robert Barclay lives in an environment with opportunities that were set by David Barclay and really the far-thinking and far-reaching Quakers of that time. On July 27, 1820, Robert Barclay marries an Anne Eliza de P. Anne Eliza de P.'s father, Thomas de P., who had arrived from St. Dominique, which is Haiti. A number of gens de color, or free families of color, had left Haiti because of the revolution, landed in Philadelphia. Thomas de P. immediately lands in Philadelphia. He looks for a Catholic church because he's coming from a French colony. We don't have that yet. So the closest he could find was the St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Kind of like when the 
French landed here and occupied Newport for a while. They had to hang out at Trinity Church. They didn't have any things to hang out. Well, that's the same case. So many of the Haitian free men and families of color are very much aligned with the St. Thomas African Episcopal Church. Thomas Capi also becomes an early subscriber and founder of the African Union Society in Philadelphia. He is a whitewasher, a painter, and actually employs a young Robert Barkley in the whitewashing painting businesses with him. Again, families are living in close family systems. But in 1820, Anne Eliza P. Robert Barclay married. And they're living in the middle of one of the most dynamic and important early 19th century black free communities. Robert and Anne Eliza P. would have four children. Their oldest daughter, Elizabeth Barclay, born in 1827. George Thomas Barclay, who I'll talk about, my great grandfather, we'll talk about a little bit later, born in 1832 and removes to Bridgeport, Connecticut. <coughs> Sophia Barkley Woolen, born in 1835, and his youngest daughter, Mary Barkley, becomes a Jackson, born in 1843, who removes to Newport in 1877. And this is from the 1850 census. You can see Robert Barkley, he's a painter, and he's listed as born in Jamaica. And the rest of the family, obviously, born in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. I want to point out one of the most difficult chapters of Philadelphia in the antebellum period. In 1833, the British Empire decided to end slavery, the British Emancipation. And several years later, West Indian countries, and Philadelphia would be the first American city by the 1836-37 to actually have, around August 1st, uh, Emancipation Day celebrations. I mean, they're just large festivities. And in Philadelphia, having such a large free black community, a large number of the black Philadelphians at that time were coming from Barbados, coming from Jamaica, and we know Haiti. So Philadelphia is the place to be to have some of the earliest and most important Manson Bay, Manson Bay parades. They are said in records that there were a thousand people marching in the streets and celebrating over several days. In the 1830s, Irish are now arriving. Germans and Irish, but Irish are now arriving. Irish are arriving poor, they're escaping the potato famine, and they're living in the poorest neighborhoods, and they're living coinciding with the black community, and there is significant tension. In fact, some of the largest race riots in American history were in Philadelphia in the 1830s between Irish moms and free blacks. But they persevered, and people would persevere. In trade and commerce, Robert Barclay, he's listed as either a painter or a cabinet maker or alternate whitewashing, which is still painted in the 1830, 1840, 1850, and 1860 census. In 18, you can see it here, in, eight, in 1837, the Quaker community came together and decided we should put an inventory of free colors, as they were called, of the community. And they created a very detailed document called the Register of Trades of Colored People in Philadelphia. And here in 1837, you can see Robert Barclay, and he is listed as a cabinet maker, and he's at 3034 South Street. His brother-in-law, the Bagel of the who is a tailor, is also at 334 South Street. So families are working together. In fact, several of the Barclay daughters are seamstress working for their uncle. Um, the three most prominent positions for free blacks in, in professional trades at that time would have been cabinet making and carpentry, tailor, seamstress for women, and barbering. In fact, when the Germans arrived, they kind of pushed black folks out of the barbering business. But, but probably the fastest path to middle class, prominence, and family wealth in the 19th century for African Americans was in the barber trades and barber fields. And it's not like today you walk in the age of leave. It's, it's an all-day experience. It's a hairdressing school. These men would come, they would socialize, they had billiards, they had cards. I mean, women probably didn't know this, why it took four hours. <laughs> there were social occasions, there was drinking. I mean, it was a time to kind of just relax for three or four hours. It was a gentleman's club, and all the things with it. And then you got a haircut and a shave. <laughs> but this 334 South Street, and particularly near the family of the P, are also actively involved in setting up what is called the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee, which is the forerunner of the Underground Railroad. And in fact, Nathaniel the P, who's here in the center, is one of the men who are the founders, along with the William Still, of what is today recognized as the 19th century underground railroad network. William Still was the leader of this effort. 
Nathaniel McKay along Robert Barclay, one of the most prominent underground stations, is the 334 South Street, which is recognized, I think it's a theater today in Philadelphia. But they would use that location as a transport for runaway and freed slaves from the South to move through Philadelphia, Pennsylvania countryside, and then out to other locations and eventually to Canada. What's most important of this for our family is, is that William Steele presented to Nathaniel P. and Robert Barclay one of his original copies, which is in the exhibit out front, one of his original copies of the Underground Railroad. It's a 400-page detail, literally step-by-step, family-by-family, path-by-path, taken by hundreds of African-Americans escaping slavery in the South through Philadelphia and other locations and eventually to Cleveland in Canada. And again, that is a personal keepsake that we have in our family that's directly tied to my great-great-grandfather, and great 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 uncle at that time in antebellum Philadelphia. So what's important to recognize is, is that these men who escaped slavery themselves are now the first generations of African American leaders who are promoting civil rights, civil liberties, freedom to those who have yet not obtained that as they're enslaved here in America. Robert Barclay dies at a ripe old age from 1861 to 73. His wife, Anna Eliza, dies in 1868. Both of them are buried at the Olive Cemetery, which would have been in downtown Philadelphia, very close on the 6th Street, to the AME Church. In 1903, they are dug up and they're reorganized and they're brought out to a suburban section of Philadelphia, which is now called the Eden Cemetery. The Eden Cemetery today is recognized as the oldest African-American-owned operated cemetery in America, dating back to 1903. Um, William still is there. Many of the famous African-American families are buried there at the Eden Cemetery. What's most important is, is that um, these Africans were able to have markers, we were able to have memorials, we were able to have recognition that few Africans, certainly not slave, but even free, would see in the mid-19th century. George Thomas Barclay, who's my great-grandfather, the oldest son, in 1862, he moves to Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, why would he go to Bridgeport, Connecticut? Well, Bridgeport, Connecticut had the second largest and most important free black community, dating back to the 1820s, an area on the south end. If you go to Connecticut, you know where they have their sports stadium on the waterfront. They have this awful um, coal fire plant. You can see it right on the highway. Well, that waterfront neighborhood was actually established by free Africans and Native Americans lodging Pagesset and Pequot Indians in the 1820s, and they called it Little Liberia. Now, this is before Liberia is even established, but it's called Little Liberia. The original name was Ethiel, and then later it evolves into Little Liberia, but it becomes this beacon where Africans and Indians who were free could buy property, build a home, have their own church, and even build their own school. So this became a beacon for free blacks. This was a place that free blacks said, I can come, I can live, I can raise a family, and I don't have to look over my shoulder. And George Barclay arrives in 1862. He marries to Francis Thorne Morris in 1863. This is actually part of their wedding set that our family owns. So this is their 1863 wedding cups with the big B there. Uh, thank God my brothers and I and other generations didn't have access to it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there. But it's, again, it's a sense of pride for the family, a sense that, you know, Free blacks also had China. Also, you know, very much loved and beloved their family, their tradition, and their belongings and their collections. And in a place called Little Liberia, it was very significant. In fact, uh, P.T. Barnum, who had also was very tied to Bridgeport, Connecticut, encouraged this land, young landscape architect named Frederick Noah Thumstead, you know a little bit about him in Newport and and such, to design what is today called Seaside Park. The area now is in transition. I actually have the privilege to work with them in Bridgeport to see if we can restore the community. Right now, it's a poor community in transition. But the park is there, and it's all Umstead. And there are several buildings that date back to the at least mid-19th century, uh, which are really extraordinary. But what's most important is, is that during the time of George Barclay in Little Liberia, it was the place to be. They had their own black-owned hotel and two black-owned hotels. This is in the 1860s. That's how extraordinary this is. Like 
In fact, the Thorne Morris families, who were Native American or Gessic Indians, they had lived there as some of the earliest members forming Little Liberia. Um, this is an actual map from about 1853, Little Liberia. And you can't see this well, but this is where Henry Morris and his family built their home and built several homes and lived. And in the 1870 federal census, Harry Morris and Cena Morris, and here is now Frances Barkley, their daughter, married to George Barkley, and beginning to have their sets of children. Uh, in fact, my grandfather was George Nicholas, who was born after the 1870 census in 1876. And in their household, which we still have a number of artifacts, um, because of the weather and such, there are things we just can't transport here. You'll see a few out front. But some of the things you'll see here is a candle holder from 1870. 1876 was centennial, kind of an important time, and this is one of their collective glasses. We have two of them left. My brother has one, I have one left from that. Um, a number, we have a whole set of table clocks. I think that was a really neat thing to do back in kind of the middle class family that, that you know, to have a parlor um, and to have like tables where you can set out like you find in silverware. But table clocks were very, very important then. I don't think they could afford the big grandfather wall and clock. So a real kind of status symbol for middle class families was to have these nice table clocks. And we've got four of them from the family members. And then a series of chairs and other furniture and things they would have. So this family in the 1860s and 70s was living well. They're living in a free black community. Um, George Barkley, himself well educated in Philadelphia. Um, he establishes a whole series of barber shops. He owns four, uh, four of the five barber shops in Bridgeport. He owns controls, including one in the Black Hotel, one in the White Hotel. He is also the clerk and administrator for the police department uh, up until the time of his death. So he's living a very good life, very solid middle, upper middle class life. In 1872, George Barkley, because his father in 1820 had helped form the Black Masonic Order in Philadelphia. In 1872, he forms the Black Mason, the Doric Lodge Number no. Four in Bridgeport, Connecticut, with a number of other leading black <coughs> trade men. Uh, in fact, and this is out front. Uh, this is the original 1856. Masonic ritual book, which I have, Masons get very mad at me because I can't, I'll show you the front cover, but I can't open the book for you because it's got all the rituals where they're like tying up one leg and doing this or such. But in any case, I'm not a Mason, I apologize. But in any case, this is the original Masonic ritual book from George Barclay that was used in the Doric Lodge of Black Masons in the 1870s. And I'm going to have two slides of legacy. I think one of the most important legacies of freedom is when you have the freedom and the ability to defend your company, your country, to serve your country. I, I am so fortunate to have, on my father's side, two ancestors uh, with pensions who fought the American Revolution as men of color. I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of men of color who fought in the American Revolution. But what's most important is, is that George Barclay's son Charles Barclay, named after Charles Barclay of Great Britain, he moves to New Haven. He becomes a painter, a very popular and very well to be in New Haven. He helps form what is called the first separate National Guard, separate meaning an all black National Guard. He's 42 years old when World War I rolls around. He then organizes his first separate unit. The first separate unit is brought to uh, Niantic, um, Connecticut. And there, they are reorganized, and he becomes the commander of the Company M of 372nd Regiment. 372nd Regiment is combined with uh, six other regiments, African-American regiments, from Ohio, Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, some several rounds with the Massachusetts and Connecticut. And they all serve under the 157th Red Hand French Division during World War I. In fact, kind of a little known all the African American men who served in combat in World War I served under a French flag. There was no time when an African American man served under his own American flag in combat in World War I. General Pershing, Woodrow Wilson, were not allowed to have African American men serving in combat and then have the audacity to come back to America and demand equality. That was not going to happen to Woodrow Wilson, it was not going to happen to America at that time. The French, who had been fighting for three years and had depleted most of their soldiers, decided that anyone 
who can hold a gun and sit in a trench and fight is good for us. And the French were already using the colonized Africans from Angola and other Africa. So my great uncle and other African American men would participate in the Battle of Argonne Forest. In fact, my great uncle had just a slight mustard gas, not too much. But they would serve and they would return and they would contribute as a legacy of freedom of serving their country. A country that still didn't see them as equal in 1918 as they returned. But nevertheless, to serve the country. <clears throat> George Nicholas Barclay, George Thomas Barclay's second youngest son, my grandfather, removes to <coughs> Newport in 1899. And he marries a Bessie Forrester Hayes, who's already in Newport in 1903, my grandmother. And they had lots of children, eight children, wonderful, including my mom, who's Ruth Eleanor Barclay. Early in the marriage, my grandfather, who had just finished Bridgeport College, who had come here, was working as a 17, 18 year old boy in the 1890s in the summer in Newport. This was the place to work for a young couple, even today, young college kids today want to work downtown with Black Pearl, Black Pearl House. They were doing it then. And my grandfather was a very young man working for the summers, worked at, Holly will love this, the Miantinomi Club, which is now Northeast yes. Colorado, <laughs> also the Washington Square. He worked at the Miantinomi Club. <laughs> He also worked at the second one, the Atlantic Place. So these were great summer jobs, it was a great social network, and they would also get to meet some of the well-to-do women of color coming from the South, like my grandmother, who were looking for good husbands, and that's how they kind of connected that time. White and black folks do the same thing. <laughs> Most importantly, when my grandfather and grandmother married, they lived with his great aunt, lived with his aunt, my great great aunt. Mary Barkley Jackson, who had arrived here in 1877. Uh, they bought a house and built a whole series of properties on what is Fillmore Street today. It was actually called Jackson Villa for a number of times. Um, I've never, I don't have any pictures of the home. I have some plat maps that show a large home and then several buildings around it. I do know that that section of, I think we call it Top of the Hill today, was a very active black neighborhood between 1870s to about the 1930s, of course, right up to World War II. So what is today Fillmore Street, Gun mm -hmm. Court, Elizabeth Street, all those areas back within there was a very prominent black community. And why? Well, because the Mount Zion African Episcopal Church was there. And we were laughing today because there's, if you go to Bellevue Avenue, you have the Viking Hotel, then you have the Hebrew Cemetery, and then you have a little street called Zion Court, and people always connect it with the cemetery and the Jewish community. It's not. It's Zion Court because it led to the Mount Zion Amy Church, which began on West Broadway, Johnson Court, but by 1870 had relocated to that location. So people like to live in close proximity where they work and where they worship. That's just a rational, reasonable thing to do. And Mary Barkley, who grew up in the AME Church in Philadelphia, was clearly going to be a part of the AME Church with her husband in Newport. They later would relocate to 82 William Street, which became again William Street, what we call Memorial Boulevard from Bellevue Avenue south to Fame Street, was called Levin Street, was a very active black community in the 1890s, the turn of the century up until World War II, and even after. And just to kind of get a sense of the family from the 1910 census, here's George Barkley. Uh, listed as mulatto. This is where the terms and description become very confusing because it could be black, it could be mulatto, it could be Indian. Native people is a real challenge because Native people never had individual identifications after the American Revolution. During the time of the American Revolution, a few years after, you would have a designation as an Indian. But as Natives would intermarry or co-mingle with African communities, they started to be seen as just non-white. So mulatto could be all of the above. It could be people who are simply black, but for whatever reason, the census take that time saw so someone who was fair, and they became mulatto. They could say I'm Indian, but I'm looking at this person here who has dark complexion. You can say you're Indian, but you're mulatto, or you're African, or you're black. But in any case, in 1910, you're living at 8284 Wayne Street. You're listed as mulatto. <laughs> My grandfather, who was a police officer for the city of Newport, his uncle, Levi Jackson, who's older, who's 70, he's the janitor at the police station. And then in 1911, my grandfather got a better job because they built this brand new, spank, fancy building called the Army Navy YMCA. 
and went over there to be the operations manager for the next 30 years until his death. What's most important, if you don't see, you can see some of the things here, they're actively involved in all the neat things going on in Newport. George Downing, the Downing Block, is the wealthiest black man at that time. He's my Aunt Dolores's, his daughter, my Aunt Dolores's godmother. They're setting up receptions for him, they're setting up programs for him, they're speaker programs. One of the things our family possesses is literally four to five dozen handbills, pamphlets, uh, advertisements of black social life in Newport between about 1870 and 1930s. And it's really neat because, you know, there's no internet, there's no TV, so they're going out every night. And they're going out late. I mean, they're starting at 10, you know, and then carriages arrive at 3. So what's really fascinating about that is, is that the African American community in Newport is very engaged with their family, with their trade, with their religion, with the civic and social issues, no different from the white family. In fact, we have a whole presentation called Gilded Age Newport in Color, which we might come back and do because it gives you a really neat perception of what was going on in Newport, separate and apart from the Van Dykes. <laughs> Not better or worse, but separate and apart. And I just want to show you very quickly some of the pictures we have of the kids. This is, this is a 1913 photograph of my old, late, oldest aunts and uncles, and it's taken at Newport Beach down on Back Road. And at that time, we didn't have Instagram or, or you know, phones on cameras or any of those things. So photography, you had to go to a studio. Well, one of the great pastimes at a beach or an amusement park was to have a photographer. So at Easton's Beach, they had set up this photographer. You can see this is a big background. This is taken in May. They had just completed Easter services at Trinity Church, so they got their whites on, and they're all taking the picture. And this is my little uncle George Barkley, uh, Harold Barkley, Richard Barkley, Naomi, and then Malcolm Barkley. And then just show some of the images. This is 1903, George Barkley. It's a great picture of Harold, my godfather, 1904, in Newport. Richard on a horse. It's supposedly in Newport. I, I have no idea where. Someone had told me that they think it's the side of Emanuel Church where they were having horse, um, kind of like a little horseback riding or pony rides at that time. Uncle Malcolm here at Newport Beach. This would have been uh, about 1932. Aunt Naomi. Charles Foster, uncle. Uncle Arnold. My Aunt Dolores during World War II. Uh, she actually, she and her cousin Mildred were the first two women of color to be hired uh, at the torpedo station uh, in 1942 um, to work as many women did. It must have been a big deal because the Newport Murder has a big article about it. You know, the first two colored girls to work, like it opened the doors, which it did. Um, and she was also in the reserve and uh, very active in many ways. This is my mom, who's still with us at 93. And getting, and then her youngest brother, uh, Alfred Stewart Barkley, and the second kind of legacies of freedom. Uh, Alfred Stewart Barkley, my, my mom's youngest brother, graduated Rogers High School here. Um, he was in the ROTC, he was the leading cadet in the ROTC, and he joined the Tuskegee Airmen, Tuskegee Airport, to serve in Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, he was killed, he had gotten his wings, they went out in formation, they tipped wings, as I'm told, and he was killed at age 19. A beautiful young man. Um, this is a letter. I have a number of letters from him to my grandmother. This one letter is really kind of interesting because it's got that 40s vernacular. He says, I'm now in Cincinnati away with Pullman from Biloxi, Mississippi. The people here are really swell, even though it's only 10 miles from the Mason-Dixon line. I was surprised to see colored girls and white girls working together at the soda fountain. So here's this 19-year-old boy from the north, from New England, ready to serve his country, who would die for his country, but still having to deal with the reality of segregation. But his legacy of freedom was, I will serve my country, I will defend my country, it's not a perfect country, but it's mine, and I wouldn't be here without it. And eventually he would die in service of his country. Uh, in fact, I, in the front we have his memorial picture, which was given by the Tuskegee Flyers, and the company provided their own Tuskegee um, flag, 48 star flag. And as I said, at that time, Newport was hopping for the free African-American community, really the turn of the 20th century. Uh, in fact, Mary Dickinson, who's this woman here from Connecticut, um, she actually was very close friends uh, with George, my grandfather, George Barkley. They'd all come as a part of a Connecticut crowd to Newport. 
Um, Mary Dickinson married to Silas Dickinson. Uh, they would establish in 1870 uh, the Travelers Block, the first black-owned female business. She had a dressmaking shop. This comes from the Newport Mercury in 1872. Mrs. Dickinson, dressmaking, number five, Travelers Block. And she talks about just had some French cabins just arrived. Mary Dickinson made a fortune basically providing dresses and formal wear for the elite in their summer parties. And again, staging herself right at the Travelers Block was right at the gateway, the entranceway of Bellevue Avenue. Mary Dickinson and her husband Silas owned 10 different properties in Newport because at that time, because of segregation, there was a large demand for summer work. Colored summer work couldn't cohabitate with white summer work. So Mary Dickinson and another woman named Nellie Brown came together and they would buy buildings around the city and allow it to be apartment houses to accommodate summer colored health. And also, as good entrepreneurs, become quite wealthy. And these are some of the cards and things from our family collection. Some of, this is George Downing's card and some of the other men's cards uh, from that time. And as I said, the social life was quite exciting for that time. Um, this is a pamphlet which I love. It's from 1902. Southwick Hall. Southwick Wall would be um, Fame Street where Buskins is, right across the street where they tore down the entire waterfront side. It was a very large hall. There's some great old photos of it. And this is a group of colored men. And the name of the club was called the Ugly Man's Fishing Club. And there's a great story behind this. Many of the African American men, um, elite men, who would come to Newport in the summer were college educated, were tradesmen, were businessmen, were well to do, they were solidly middle and upper middle class. But regardless of that, they weren't going to be members of the Reading Room or Bailey's Beach or any private club anywhere. So the men came together and they decided to form their own fishing club because that was a very important pastime. And we, we actually own my great-great-grandfather's fishing poles and gear and tackle and this ugly man's fishing club is this inside joke of, well, if we can't be members of these white institutions, it's got to be because we're ugly. It can't be because of color or any other issue. So this inside joke of the club is ugly man's fishing club, and it was in Newport and New York and Boston. They would have different, they would meet for social events, they'd meet for civic events, but they'd also meet for more serious events. And in 1902, probably the most topical issue at that time is, are the mental capacities of the sexes equal? And the chairman of the group is William S. Braithwaite of Boston. William Braithwaite also had a summer place here on the Boy Street. He was at the time probably the leading black poet. And probably one of the most um, well-known of black poets of America at that time. He was born in Boston but summered in Newport. And some of the men here is kind of a who's who of some of the earliest prominent black families of New England and Newport. It includes my grandfather George Barkley there and my great uncle Dr. Mainland Van Horn was the state's first black dentist. And as I said before, their church life was important. And in the case of the Barclay families, they would center in two very important churches. Mary Barclay and her family was very much tied to the Mount Zion AME Church. George Barclay and my grandmother very much tied to Trinity Episcopal Church. Kind of like what happened in Philadelphia. One group went to the Episcopal, one group to the AMA Episcopal. But in any case, in Newport, both was very tied to the churches. We're also very tied by marriage to the Van Horn family to the Union Congregational Church. Uh, the Union Congregational Church is the first free black church in Newport, the second in Rhode Island behind the Cognitive Church dating back to 1824. Their building, which was built in 1880, this very nice Gothic building, still stands on Division Street. Um, we have a number of collections from the AMA and from those churches, even in Trinity Church. So as an example, this is a Holy Bible from the Union Congregational Church that our family owns from 1858. Um, here's one of a number of giving or gift envelopes that you have. I, my mother used to say, because the brother used to take them and stuff them in their pocket because they didn't want to give them money. So you just kind of hit it, stuff them in their pocket. In any case, we've got lots of these. The congregational church Maybe that's why. Um, we have a number of church chairs from the churches, which are beautiful, which my wife and my brother have been restoring. And then right here, you don't get to see it, but it's very close, but uh, here at the Mount Zion Amy Church, they're actually having a debt or a mortgage retirement event. They always had events so they could raise money to retire the mortgage on the church. And it's my great-great uncle and others who are all here and setting up this event. 
And again, this is Union Congregational Church in Division Street. It's heyday, and this is Mount Zion AME Church as it would stand behind the Hebrew Cemetery in Zion. This is burned down, I'm going to say 1959, so we should help you on that, 60, around that time. There was a couple of fires, well, fires of Logan, but there were a couple of fires in that back, because there was a colored nursing home back there also. Uh, they were all burned down and lost. And then the final resting place for the Barclays here, um, my grandfather, my grandmother, some of my uncles, my dad, are buried here at the common burial ground. We have a large family plot in what is today the Gaza Laker section, um, which is poetic for us because we're tied to the earliest African slave and free cemetery in America, as the Barclays were in Philadelphia. And this is actually a picture of me at six. So this is like 1965. I'm with my mom um, here at you can see, actually, they had the very nice roads at the common burial ground. They actually had, I was told that they were actually kind of clamshell, crushed shell roads. They were all laid out very, very nice. And here I am at my Uncle Alfred, who was the sea airman, and grow little flower, which we still do to this day, uh, to this burial area. <laughs> and I want to end here, because I know it's been 220 years in about an hour, but this is something that my grandmother, uh, Bessie Forrester Barker would say when I was very young. She would bring me to the Redwood Library, she'd bring me out to different places to see history. And one of the things that she would emphasize to me, which is really, I think, has influenced me today and how I see not only my own family history, but the history of African people, slavery is how we got here, but it tells you little to who we are as a people. In 2016, going forward, the story is not slavery, the story is about the people. And one of the things that we have here in Newport, as compared to anywhere else, is we have the primary and secondary records of the African people of the 18th and 19th century. And as we can unveil these records and present these records, we're going to know more about those important people and their contributions, but we're going to know a lot more about ourselves. So let me grab some water. Thank you for being patient. I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, in the case of William Street, well, first of all, all of Levin Street is now Memorial Boulevard. It's, it's a lot of, several homes were, were saved by the Restoration Foundation, thank goodness for them. Many were taken down. On William Street, 8284 is now, um, I think it's a hair salon. No, they're, they're, they've been taken down. Yeah, it's the chocolate store on there. Yeah, I have some old photographs that they look like. Very tall, white buildings, three-story buildings. They actually own the properties of both the William Street side and two properties on the Levin Street side, the Memorial side. Parker Watch? Uh, Parker Watch is my great grandfather's. Okay. Yeah, that's George T. Barclays that he gave to his son, my grandfather, who gave to my uh, uncle Forrester, who gave to me when I was little. Okay. I think because I was just hanging around and used it. And now my two sons are kind of uh, playing with who gets it. It doesn't operate, we keep it under glass. Yes. Did the Quakers set up some schools for the, you know, the, the African Americans? Well, the, the, yeah, the, the Quakers set up schools. How did you um, learn to read? How they did. Learn it, well, first of all, the Quaker community in Philadelphia was setting up schools for the enslaved community as early as the 1740s and 50s. Here in Newport, we have similar circumstance with Trinity Episcopal Church in the 1760s. In the case of this group, which is quite interesting, this is why this is a well thought out reparations effort. The 20 Africans, four had died relatively early, possibly through just the change of weather and, and such. Each and every one of them was assigned a member of the Quaker church who was required to see to their education, to see to a trade, to be indentured if they're a child until they're 18 or 21, and most importantly, to help them navigate this new world, this new life. So the records that I had there, I actually have another set of records from the Pennsylvania Historical Society that actually has each of them assigned. And in many cases, many of them become active members that survive of either the African Methodist Church or the Church of St. Thomas African Episcopal Church. The challenge is, is that the only family that we've been able to trace and track has been mine just because we keep everything, thank God. Thank God, we keep everything. Um, and then we've just, <clears throat> but more importantly, my ancestors were involved in very active 
African American organizations that kept records and minutes, Masonic organizations, church groups, church records, other groups and such. So that was rare. Others were not as active and they were lost or we haven't found the records yet. We have found the David Quash up until 1840, but he's single. And then we lose him by 1850. He either leaves or he dies, we just don't know. Um, so right now, mine's the only line that we're working with Jamaica and the UK that we can trace and connect right through. Okay. So, what is now the James Pickens Theater was the Mount Zion Episcopal Church. That was the white one. Oh. That was the white one. Yeah. The, the Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church started in Johnson Court in 1854-55. A small the house is still there. In the back. Then in 1872 or 73, they moved to what was the dining room of the Bellevue House Hotel. Oh. And that became the Mount Zion after the Episcopal Church. And then it burned down. Now they're on Van Zandt, which people collab with help. Right. Yes. But that was, a, again, you have to understand the 18, or well, even the 19, 20s, and 30s, and 40s, there's still separation. Uh, but, but that was founded in. Um, that was built in, in 1830. Um, 1830. Yeah, 35. 35. That is right. So it's very early, and that's why I was wondering. Because that's the same time that Philadelphia was no, the, celebrating. The first free black organized charter church is Union Congregational in Newport, and that's 1824. And then you have the Mount Zion AME, about 1852, and then you have now the end of the Civil War and Southern Blacks moving up and watching Baptists moving from Baptist Church, and then the Mount Shiloh Baptist Church is established where Sardellas is on Levin Street, and then a second one, Mount Olivet, which started on Thames Street, and now that all combined was today the Community Baptist Church, Marcus Wheaton Boulevard, so that's my recollection of it. So, so the, the New England Northern people of color who were free tended to be an Episcopal Methodist church. Southern blacks are more oriented to the Baptist church. And, that, and if you look at my family pen, that's why they always, even my grandma who came from a Jewish family, there's a whole other story, she and her sisters converted. And the, the funny story was when she married my grandfather, she says, I'm going to be in the, the, the biggest and most important Episcopal church. And she went to Trinity which was her decision. And so all my aunts and uncles and myself and all of us have all grown up in Trinity Church since, mm -hmm. since at least 1903. Mm -hmm. Even though her, her husband stayed with the Methodist Church and her aunts stayed with the other churches. But that's, that's how things were. Mm -hmm. Very good. Great presentation, Keith. I'm really like this final part. I've seen you give this presentation in various ways and you're really pulling the narrative together in a very strong way. The question I have is, you started out by saying that you want to position this within the Black Lives Matter um, sort of larger narrative, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you see that, that connection happening. Well, this is my viewpoint. I mean, it, never once in my family was there a slave. They were enslaved. They were human beings who were enslaved. And they were not objects. They were not chattel property. They were men, women, and children, and wives. And somehow, some way, through their creative survival, through leaders like in the Quaker Church, and leaders like David Barclay, they were able to persevere. The Black Lives Matter movement is essentially, today, saying, we matter. We're, we're, we're not chattel property that can be hunted down, or shot in the streets, or be left behind. We're flesh and blood people. And for me, as I interpret the history of Africans, I have to talk about the reality of slavery and what it meant to them and the people and the institutions that benefited from it. But the story today for me going forward is what my grandmother told me, which is tell the story to people. Black Lives Matter is trying to desperately shake everyone to say black people matter. Not more than whites, not less than whites, but right now, at this time of this country, we matter. And as I try to interpret this history, I try to tie it all together. I mean, everyone in my family, to their credit, decided to continue to contribute to making their community a better place. And I hope I can do some small part of that to this day. 
But it's important to recognize that many, many people of African heritage in this city today, in this state, in this country, are not doing well. They don't feel well. I mean, it's really great that I can go and trace this history, but it's rare. It's rare for anyone black, green, purple, white, young, old. It's rare. And within the black community, it's even rarer. So the challenge is, is that for a lot of black folks, we don't want to talk about slavery anymore because it's negative, it's oppressive, it further objectifies us. We want to talk about when we're heroes. We want to talk about when we're succeeding. We want to talk about when we're in power, not when we're powerless. So I'm very much tied to the fact that as I present this history, I recognize the slave, but it's not the priority for me anymore. It's not the interest for me all. Because quite candidly, when I give these presentations to larger African American groups, you've got to see the light bulbs pop up and the eyes open up. Because all of a sudden, it's neat to be black. All of a sudden, it's so much more than 12 years of slave, or roots, or birth of a nation. Because now they start to learn these new names, these new people, these new locations. All of a sudden, history becomes a part of them. I, I can tell you. Even as I grew up, one of the challenges I had was having too much knowledge as a 10-year-old kid or a 15-year-old kid, as my kids did, having too much knowledge because I was always like correcting people, correcting teachers and saying no because I always knew that I had a family that was always directing me and good friends, maybe the late Eleanor Keys, all these people were in my universe who kept reminding me, you know, you matter. So I grew up thinking very strongly that being black was cool. It was, I didn't think about anything negative until I had to open up a paper or read a book or look at a TV screen. That's not the experience, for, unfortunately, for many African Americans in this city, in this state, in this country. So I think history is one of many pathways. One is to give them the whole truth and the whole picture of their African, African American experience and then build an identity with that. Because I, I may get in trouble with this, but. I, I remember 20 years ago, I was in Virginia doing a lecture, and this older gentleman, white gentleman, came up to me, and he said, you know, that was, and I, on my mother's side, and on my maternal grandmother's side is the Virginia part, and they go all the way back, and he came up to me and he said, and he was giving me a comment, he goes, you know, young man, that was a great lecture, and I have to tell you, um, my family go back to the first families of Virginia. And I looked at him and said, well, I know, my family was there to reach you. And he didn't get the joke. He just kind of like this went out the way. But my whole point was is that, you know what? History is important to me too. It's a pathway to me too. And I have just as right to be here in this lecture hall in Richmond as you do. You know, I was being that smart alecky 12 year old, 15 year old. But the point is, it's all about empowerment. Knowing your history, having a historical identity, gives you the power to get the best education, buy the best home, have the best job, do the best for your family because you're entitled for it. Historical entitlement is one of the most powerful things that a person can have. African American people don't have that yet. So that's why I focus on the history of the people, the history of the people and their institutions, to give power and entitlement to young African Americans so they can get off the streets, go to college, have a career, manage a family, and have a good life. Because that's not happening right now. <coughs> my daughter, my final position, you can see I'm passionate about this. My oldest daughter lives in Brooklyn. And she's very active in the Black Lives Matter movement in New York. And some of you know her very well. She's a great kid. And she wanted to live right in the community. She's on Crown Heights, right on Eastern Parkway, right off New York Avenue. She loves it. But, and it's great because half the community is Hasidic Jewish. The other half of the community is Jamaican. So she's like right in the middle of it. But the one thing she says to me, she's been here six years now, is, is that I always feel badly to the fact that I'm looking at these kids on the subway, and they're not going to succeed. She goes, she feels like she's a survivor. How did I like that? She gets mad at me. Don't you, you and mom give me a good life. And, you know, I'm embarrassed about that. Uh, but that's a sad point, because she's a good kid. She's highly successful, good young woman. She's highly successful. She's living where she wants to be. But she's stepping back and looking around and saying, my God. You know, I'm here doing well, and I have choices because of David Barkley gave my ancestor training skills and a break. These same folks didn't have a David Barkley. And look where they are, living in Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights. So 
I just want to just emphasize the fact that history is an incredibly powerful tool that gives you a sense of identity and entitlement. And that's something that we need to do for African American families. I'm very passionate about that. Give them the self, same sense of identity and entitlement. And it's fun, it's interesting. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And please look at the exhibit out there.